Well, I would invite you please to open your copies of God's Word to John's Gospel, chapter 21. John, chapter 21. We're going to begin reading at verse 15 to the end of the chapter. John, chapter 21, beginning at the 15th verse. Give attention to the Word of God. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them the one who also had leaned back against him during the supper and had said, Lord, who is that is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So the saying spread abroad among the brothers that this disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him he was not to die. But if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things. And we know that his testimony is true. Now there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. This is the word of God. May he bless the reading and the preaching of it this morning. Uh, when I was a little boy, uh, I would sometimes walk into the room where my parents uh, were talking and the conversation would abruptly stop uh, or perhaps continue in uh, hushed tones and uh, my suspicions or my curiosity were aroused naturally and my ears were burning uh, and I'd say well, what are you talking about and of course uh, they'd both give me that look uh, that conveyed not a chance um, and my mother I remember this distinctly my mother would just look at me and tap her nose like this you tap her nose like this and of course all this body language uh, burning ears that look tapping of the nose, uh, communicated one message to me very clearly. Mind your own business. Now, I, of course, they may have been speaking about me or one of my siblings, uh, some private matter that didn't concern me, um, or uh, perhaps it was simply above my pay grade as a child. Uh, children uh, can sometimes just be downright nosy. But of course, when we become adults, uh, uh, we don't do that anymore. Right? <laughs> or do we? I want to suggest that my parents' unsubtle message, mind your own business, is a message we all need as Christians. And I think particularly uh, those of us who God is calling to be pastors. And it's a message that Jesus explicitly teaches Peter in the passage before us, especially in verses 21 and 22. When Peter saw him, that's John, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Let me commend to you this morning this Christian grace 
of minding your own business. And I want to do so by opening these two questions that we find in our text. First, what about this man? And second, what is that to you? First of all then, what about this man? What about this man? Let's compare these two men for a moment. Here we have two seminarians. Uh, they're about to graduate from their three-year seminary program. They've been with Jesus and with each other for three whole years. Uh, Peter and John and their fellow disciples have received the Great Commission. They are to go out into all the nations and preach the gospel. They're to pour their lives into the pastoral ministry. Feed my lambs, Jesus says. Feed my sheep. Tend my sheep. And if you think you have some good seminary stories to tell, uh, these two seminarians uh, have far more. They have witnessed stupendous miracles. And however much you may appreciate uh, the faculty here at RPTS, uh, no teacher taught uh, like their seminary professor. So Peter and John have a lot in common. Uh, and they have a lot in common not only with each other, but with you. They've grown close as brothers over these years. Uh, their hearts have burned within them as Jesus opened the scriptures to them. They've had their own fair share of theological arguments and disputes in class. Uh, they've been discipled and trained and equipped. They've studied under the great pastor of the sheep. They've completed their preaching trials. They've had their triumphs and their falls. And yet, Peter and John are two very different men. What about this man, Peter? Well, we could caricature Peter in this particular text as backslidden and restored. Peter's just had a very, very serious fall. I think it's fair to say the first part of this conversation with Jesus is probably the best known. And it, uh, Jesus restores Peter and recommissions him for ministry after his three scandalous denials. And the dialogue, of course, contains Peter's betrayal and restoration. It's full of echoes of that night Jesus was betrayed. Uh, by a fire, Peter had denied Jesus, and now by a fire, Jesus uh, restores him. And the threefold denial, of course, is matched by this threefold recommissioning. But we're also told about Peter's future ministry as he graduates uh, from Christ's seminary. Jesus uh, gives him a unique prediction about his ministry. And we learn that he was to be afforded the honor of a martyr's death on a cross. Verse 18, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you're old, you'll stretch out your hands. Another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. And this he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. Peter's future ministry was going to involve suffering, suffering greatly. He was going to lose the freedoms of his youth, and he will be led to a place he doesn't want to go, where the executioners will be waiting to stretch out his hands on a crossbeam to be crucified. It's a, a sobering personal prophecy. Now, follow me. These words Jesus issues should have been the last word in the conversation, but Peter here interjects a somewhat inappropriate question. What about this man? Well, what about this man, John? If Peter can be caricatured here as backslidden and restored, we could caricature John here in this text as faithful and following. He is, after all, the disciple whom Jesus loved. In verse 20, always close behind. A believer who had a particularly close walk with Jesus we're told here that he's the one who had been reclining at table close to him and had said, Lord, who is it that's going to betray you? He had leaned on Jesus' breast at the supper. There's an intimacy of friendship. It's John who stayed in the high priest's courtyard when Peter ran outside weeping bitterly. It was John who had been present at the cross when Peter had fled into hiding. It was John who had taken Jesus' mother into his care at Golgotha. And so here in verse 20, when Peter turns and looks, John is exactly where we'd expect him to be, following them. It's a study in comparisons. 
John's future ministry is also contrasted with Peter's. We know that Peter's ministry would culminate in a violent death, but John, in contrast, after receiving the glorious vision of Revelation, would die peacefully in his bed on Patmos. So maybe it shouldn't surprise us that Peter would ask Jesus this question, Lord, what about this man? But I want to propose this morning that it tells us something concerning about Peter's heart. Jesus is graciously dealing with Peter. He's recommissioning Peter. He's discussing Peter's future ministry, but Peter's mind is elsewhere. He's literally looking over his shoulder and saying, what about him? What about him? And I would submit to you that Peter is indulging a very subtle and very common ministerial sin. It's the sin of self-comparison, which is really just a form of meddling. In other words, Peter needs to mind his own business. And we know it's an unhealthy self-comparison because it brings forth this gentle admonition from our Lord. What is that to you? You follow me. In C.S. Lewis's Narnian novel, The Horse and His Boy, which we all know is the best one in the series, <clears throat> Aravis asks Aslan about the fate of a maidservant that she had treated uh, terribly. Child, said the lion, I am telling you your story, not hers. No one is told any story but their own. And so it is with us. This text warns against the temptation of unhealthy preoccupation with others' ministries, which distracts you from your own ministry and breeds jealousy, envy, pride, and a host of other ministry-destroying evils. And it's this pastoral sin I want to address by considering the second question in the text. What is that to you? What is that to you? Jesus' words are a rebuke to this common ministerial sin of self-comparison, and it's an exhortation to the Christian grace of minding your own business. Again and again in ministry, you will be tempted to ask, Lord, what about this man? So I want to make some application in the remainder of my time by asking two practical questions. Number one, when is it appropriate to ask, what about this man? When is it appropriate to ask, what about this man? <clears throat> well, the thrust of the passage is to admonish Peter for asking an inappropriate question. It's important to briefly mention first a few exceptions to the rule by way of balance. It is appropriate to ask the question when a brother pastor is in trouble. There are valid reasons to inquire after fellow pastors. I remember a time in ministry when I was dealing with pastoral burnout. And a pastoral colleague called me up, and he asked, how are you doing? I'm, I'm concerned about you. I've been watching you, and I'm very concerned. Here was a vigilant brother who asked, Lord, what about this man? And I'm so glad he did. He wasn't prying. He wasn't meddling. And the result was rich encouragement and accountability until I came through the other side. It's appropriate to ask the question when a brother pastor needs church discipline. You encounter sometimes occasions when a minister is charged with doctrinal error or perhaps some gross moral failure. Lord, what about this man? That, of course, is properly a question for the corporate body to ask as it brings the censures of the church to bear in the hopes of repentance and restoration. In a sense, we might say church discipline is the church courts asking, Lord, what about this man? And there's another occasion. It's appropriate to ask this question when there are genuine threats to your flock. Now, there is, we might say, an opposite sin of omission to the sin of ministerial meddling, and that is ministerial neglect. We are called, says Ezekiel, to be watchmen. Watchmen on the wall, it's our duty to sound the trumpet whenever we see danger. God otherwise will require the blood of his flock at our hands. So if you're busily feeding your sheep, 
and you're sweetly oblivious to the presence of a false teacher, then that is a failure to shepherd too. And at such times, it is appropriate to ask, Lord, what about this man? He's a danger to your sheep. Give me wisdom as I deal with this. It's a sign you're following him when you are tending his sheep. But all of that said, Jesus' words to Peter are in the first place an admonition. So we want to ask, secondly, when is it inappropriate to ask this question? What about this man? Well, for one thing, I would suggest we need to ask this uh, when there is an unhealthy preoccupation with successful pastors. An unhealthy preoccupation with successful pastors. This text reveals a temptation to jealousy of other, others' ministerial prospects and gifts. As we've seen, Pastor John uh, was blessed with a particularly close relationship with the Lord that Pastor Peter didn't share. Pastor John's pastoral track record was free from the kind of scandalous falls that marred Pastor Peter's. And the prospects of his future ministry appeared comparatively rosy a long life of ministry, and a non-violent death that would greet Peter and the other 11 disciples. Now, you're not going to have the same kind of premonitions uh, about your fellow graduates from RPTS, but in the years ahead, you may see some of them really prospering in ministry and become preoccupied with them. Lord, what about this man? You may be tempted to discontentment by what you perceive to be your own comparative lack of gifts and graces and opportunities. But this text reminds us that it is the Lord who sovereignly distributes his talents. You remember the parable of the talents. The master called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. You may be sitting here this morning, and you're a one-talent guy, right? You're a one-talent pastor, or you may be a five-talent pastor. You have different abilities. But the point is, it's all his property. It's all his property. The wonder is that he would entrust any of it to any of us at all. That should be a call that he should call us from the pit of our rebellion like Peter and say to you, do you love me? And feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. There's no need for you to compare yourself to that five-talent guy. There's no place for that. Maybe you'll need to hear Jesus say to you, if I will that their churches grow and their blogs proliferate and they get published by Crossway and their sermon downloads outstrip yours and their ministries multiply, what is that to you? You follow me. You follow me. An unhealthy preoccupation with successful pastors. But I think we can also ask this inappropriately when there's an unhealthy preoccupation with fallen pastors. With fallen pastors. Isn't it also true that we can have just as unhealthy a preoccupation with brothers in Christ who have stumbled? And they've fallen. And Peter's faults here were great. His threefold denial had been public and scandalous. His reputation as a pastor could have been destroyed. That's doubtless, of course, why the Scriptures record this personal threefold recommissioning to feed Christ's lambs. The history of the church, past and present, is littered with accounts of pastoral failure. And we can read about them. And we can say self-righteously, Lord... What about this man? Join the ranks of the scandalized. Jesus says to you and to me, what is that to you? What is that to you? You follow me. Yes, there are solemn warnings to be gained from such tragedies, to be sure. There will be those cases where we may be called to administer church discipline, like we've said. But surely, surely Jesus' admonition to Peter here reminds you that you should instead be more interested in whether you are going to fall. What is that to you? You follow me. 
And when you first hear a warning about the imminent apostasy of a disciple like Judas or of a humiliating fall of a disciple like Peter, your first instinct should be to cry out, Lord, is it I? Not, Lord, what about this man? But Lord, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Let him who thinks he stand firm take care, lest he fall. And if I may, let me add one more. I'm not being graded in this sermon. <laughs> There's an unhealthy preoccupation with successful pastors and an unhealthy preoccupation with fallen pastors. I think another way we, we do this is we have an unhealthy preoccupation with being in the loop. Being in the loop. Our text warns us that asking this question is how rumors start. Did you notice that in verse 23? So the saying spread abroad among the brothers. And what was the saying? That this disciple wasn't going to die. But Jesus didn't say to him he wasn't going to die, but if it's my will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? The saying spread. And the clear implication, I think, is it spread from Peter. So much so that John feels compelled to end the fourth gospel with a touch of damage control. The rumors of my non-death have been greatly exaggerated. He says, you've heard the saying? Well, I was there. Jesus didn't say that. This is actually what he said. Friends, when we ask the question, Lord, what about this man? It rarely remains a rhetorical question. In other words, we can find ourselves speculating about this man. And often we speculate about this man, whoever he is, to others in hushed voices, perhaps in private Facebook groups, in ministerial cliques. You see, Peter had asked Jesus privately, what about this man, John? Which then led to the whole Christian community asking the same question. What about this man, John? Did you hear? Well, I, I, I heard that Jesus said he wasn't going to die. No way. Really? And so the saying spread among the brothers, and John himself has to step in and set the record straight. So this is a question we need to be careful with. We can have an unhealthy preoccupation with successful pastors or with fallen pastors, or we can have an unhealthy preoccupation with being in the loop. Well, let me close with this. What is the cure for this unhealthy preoccupation with other pastors? Well, the answer, friends, is to instead become preoccupied with Jesus. Other words here, you follow me. You follow me. Now, they're not only a rebuke for an unhealthy comparison to the ministry of others. They are the cure for it. You recover from this sin by a renewed focus on Christ and a renewed focus on your own ministry. In other words, the cure for sinful ministerial comparisons of all your unhealthy preoccupation with others is the Christian grace of minding your own business. Your own business. Don't you worry about John, Peter. John's following me. Let him get on with that. You follow me too. The more focused we are on Jesus, the less distracted we'll be by what Jesus has called others to do. And the more focused we are on our own ministry, our own sphere of service that Jesus called us to do, the less we will be making unhealthy comparisons that breed envy, jealousy, or contempt. Jesus says no one having put his hand to the plow, looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. How many pastors are not plowing their own field because they're too busy meddling in the field next door? or gazing jealously at how much fruit is being produced in the field over there. If you want to produce a crop yourself, you need to plow, and you need to sow, and then you will reap. The last word goes this morning to Jonathan Edwards. He says this, The spiritually proud person is apt to find fault with other saints, and to be quick to discern and take note of their deficiencies, but the eminently humble Christian has so much to do at home and sees so much evil in his own heart and is so concerned about it 
that he is not apt to be very busy with others' hearts. The antidote for unhealthy comparisons is undistracted discipleship. Lord, what about this man? What is that to you? You follow me. Amen. Let's close by singing together Psalm 130.